www.ecosystemsolutions.org. Really digging into some of the you know, changing dynamics in the networking space. And, and if we talk about networking, you know, one of the biggest you know, explosions that are going on is in the service provider space. And joining me for this segment is Luke Norris, who's the CEO of Pete Colo. So uh, people that have watched Wikibon, actually we had Luke on for a Peer Insight a couple of weeks ago, and Luke's been making the circuit. At VMworld, he did the super session with NetApp, uh, he was at AT&T Park, and he's a bit of a rock star here uh, when you're talking about the service provider space and some of the transformations going on in IT. So, Luke, first of all, welcome to theCUBE. Uh, well, thank you, and uh, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> a absolutely, you, you know, really, you know, love to talk about people that are really driving new technologies, you know, taking new ways of, uh, of, of driving business, and you know, service providers, in a lot of ways, are helping to drive really kind of the, uh, the, the tip of the spear as to who's adopting new technology. In a lot of ways, you have you know, less legacy uh, than the enterprise environments, and you can start with more of a clean sheet organizationally and, and equipment-wise. So, uh, for people that haven't heard before, give us a little bit about your background and uh, how you started Picolo. Sure, so um, I came from the service provider area. Um, I was uh, spent a couple years over at SunGuard Availability Services. It really sort of formed uh, the model for Peak Colo. And Peak Colo is really a service provider to service providers. We build baseline infrastructure services, allowing SaaS and PaaS providers to build products on top of us. And really also uh, leading the transformation for the VAR community to start actually selling cloud-based services. Um, and they do that based on top of our Powered by Peak Colo brand. Okay, and, and you, but you have your own facilities, correct? Um, we do have our own facility in Denver, and then we also do white-labeled services throughout data centers all across the country. Um, we're currently in Denver and Seattle, and we just uh, announced uh, New Jersey and Chicago coming online. Excellent, and uh, Piccolo's been around for how long and how many kind of generations of technology have you, you gone through <laughs> since you launched? Um, we've been around for six years and I think we're on our sixth iteration of the cloud. It, and that's actually probably what makes service providers uh, so much more adaptable to it. Our procurement cycles are really driven by business demand yep. instead of uh, by three year or five year sort of acquisition level cycles. Yeah. So we're able to see what new technologies out there address that as a product offering and bring it to the market in a much more rapid scenario. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody is dealing with growth, but you guys have hyper growth. You sure. know, C could you give some some specs as to you know what what kind of growth you guys are experiencing? Yeah, um, I mean, in the course of a year, uh, I think we've grown over three petabytes just within one data center. So let alone across multi data centers, I wouldn't know that. I also know one facility has now reached about 15,000 VMs, wow. and um, I couldn't even go with the petabytes of RAM that that's actually running. Because what we find is actually our VMs are averaging 32 to 64 gigs of uh, memory just within the VM itself. So I mean, you extrapolate that out over tens of thousands of VMs, it's a massive scale to deal with. Uh, we also just run into an incredible issue of VLAN overlaps and IP overlaps. Uh, you can't tell you how many enterprises still have 10.10.10 or 192.168 as their initial IP offering that they built within their data center. And when they try to move to a cloud, they can't change that. Their so applications are embedded in it. How many VMs do you have in that environment? In one particular environment, yeah. well over 10,000. Okay, so you know, one of the things that Brocade announced today is you know, really these just giant scalable fabric environments, and they can go up to 300,000 VMs. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is, you know, do you need that? Or, you know, I found service providers, a lot of times their networks aren't as large as even some uh, enterprises because they have kind of pods in yep. different locations. So what, what's your yeah, experience? Yeah, uh, we actually have a design methodology and we call it failure zones and we keep our failure zones very, very small. Okay. Um, so we wouldn't actually use maybe uh, the generation of the data just released here, those larger, larger switches that can do hundreds if not uh, thousands of connections. We'll actually do more discrete level switches to keep our failure zones very, very small. Okay, and, and can give us a little bit more granularity on that if you can. You know, how large do we do it, and is it just to keep the layer too small for you know virtualization mm -hmm. reasons, or you know what what what, what reasons? Um, it, it's kind of going back to almost Brocade's old methodology that they themselves built very small pods when it came to the SAN-based architecture, mm -hmm. and we're sort of following through with that on this VCS and the VDX level architecture. We're building these to about 15 to 20 60-port VDX switches, and, and it's more doing an isolation level um, for how many physical servers we can connect in. Uh, we're not worried about overrunning the ARP address uh, translation maximization, which we're talking about now. Yeah. So you could see 15, maybe uh, 5,000 to 10,000 VMs in one of these VCS pods. And then we use layer three technology to sort of map between them. 
um, no matter how stable Trill is, there's still the human error, there's still the human factor, there's upgrades that need to happen, um, there's generational changes, we're on the first generation of the uh, VDX switches, we want to move to the next generation mid next year. So the ability to swap those out, you have to have those more constrained failure zones. Okay, so, so Brocade talked about they have 700 customers now running VCS, and, and you're one of them. You know, what's your experience been? How did you get to VCS? Can you kind of walk us through that yeah. process? Yeah, we did a, a very tight vendor selection. Uh, we looked at uh, everybody that was coming to the market, and then the people that were actually at the market. And Brocade was at the market, and this was probably November of 2011, uh, maybe a little earlier. Um, and we were one of the early, early adopters, first line of code, I literally think the code was a 1.0 code set. We went to production soon thereafter once the code uh, set was based off. And what we were actually looking for is unifying the entire fabric. We wanted to get away from a fiber channel idea or a secondary iSCSI fabric and actually just have a unified 10 gig fabric across the board. And Brocade's expertise on the storage side really gave us sort of the comfort level that that's what we could do it on and this was the platform to build it out of. Yeah, yeah one of the things I found interesting about your case study is you actually, when you went to Brocade, you eliminated your fiber channel environment. Absolutely. So one of the discussion points I was having with Mike Clayco earlier is, you know, fiber channel is doing fine from a growth standpoint, but the customers that are moving off their SAN aren't necessarily moving to another you know, tech protocol, sure. what they're doing is moving to a service provider, and the service providers, you know, in, 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 for the most part, are running on Ethernet, so. Yeah, the, the functionality that's inherent with Ethernet is much more scalable and has uh, many more robust features when it comes to the agility. Uh, literally, our SAN's virtualized, and we can literally shuffle around at an IP level uh, the virtual machines, not only where they're at, but also their target on their SAN. In a fiber, uh, fiber channel environment that's very constrained and the technology set just doesn't seem to be coming there as fast. So if you're looking at a roadmap of adoption, now that uh, the VDXs have the latency that everyone's bragging about, the 0.3 mils, uh, now that they actually have the speed, 10 gigs, 40 gigs, it, it, the collapse is going to happen. And now as a service provider, you can make those moves ahead of time, commoditize that, and actually uh, monetize it as well. Uh, it makes sense day one to do that. Okay, so, so your customers are service providers. One of the, the, right. the biggest questions we have about cloud adoption in general is you know, where do the applications live and you know, what does a hybrid cloud look like? So the question I have for you is, you know, there's some applications that customers are keeping in-house, making private cloud environments, there's other applications that they're saying, I'm going to go to mm -hmm. you know, some as a service uh, type solution, and the question is, are there applications, am I, are those two separate ones that I just need to maintain, or are you actually seeing things like cloud bursting becoming reality today? You know, what we find uh, is the main limitation on all this is just how fast literally you can move one packet from one location to another. Uh, and the speed of light's not changing. Um, and that's actually a lot of our growth strategy is putting these uh, micro clouds in all the major cities. Because we find out that when these enterprises are on three and five year adoption cycles, but their applications and their customer demands aren't following those uh, adoption cycles, if we can actually give them an agile infrastructure to do cloud bursting, they'll do it if that latency, if their core applications will respond in out of house as if they were the same in house. Yeah. Um, the easy ones of course are DR, of course are development. But what we find out is where you actually derive value and where the organizations are really adopting is actually in production, as long as you can achieve that sort of latency limit there. Okay, um, Dave Stevens in his presentation this morning, Brocade CTO, said that you know distance doesn't matter anymore, and uh, you know Brocade has some nice WAN solutions, mm -hmm. but, but you know what I've heard from you, and I've definitely heard from others, you know latency is so critically yeah. important. You know flash type solutions on the storage side, you know if I need mobile applications and VDI remotely, you know latency is critical. So, you know, how are you helping to overcome the the, the challenges of the speed of light? Sure. So. Um, I think he did have a correct point. I mean, our, our site-to-site -site nodes are 40, 80, 100 gigs of literal throughput that we can put between our data centers. So in that aspect, it, it looks and feels as if it's local. But the reality is, is if it you know, uh, crosses a couple states and it's 10 milliseconds, that, that itself is a time-induced latency on the applications. Exactly. Um, and our growth strategy, as I pointed out earlier, is to drop these cloud nodes in the local uh, cities that sort of have the geographical uh, regency for there. So if you're not just in Seattle, you're in Denver, Chicago, New Jersey, Texas, uh, uh, say Austin and maybe Dallas because that state's so big where you can actually then cloud burst into that node that's close enough so the latency is maybe in the three to five millisecond range and, and that's uncomprehensible. That's a couple of you know bats of your eye. You're not going to notice that. Um, so from a speed of light perspective, we actually think that's the delineator and the determinator that differentiates us on the market. And Brocade is doing some great things about um, I just got done uh, sitting through another session on the next line of VDX on uh, driving the latency down so that now the virtual routing and all the aspects of routing, all the aspects of virtual MAC addresses will literally just propagate out to the first hop possible. 
Um, so now you can actually make one decision point but push it out uh, throughout you know, your entire nodes. But still as an enterprise, when it comes to adoption, they have to get just that speed of light variable as low as possible. Okay, so Luke, it sounds like you use technology as a differentiator in, in your business. You adopted kind of the Trill VCS functionality mm -hmm. early. Um, you know, what technology areas are you looking to uh, for kind of your, your, your next spin? Um, we're almost looking at uh, Trill as a base fabric. Yeah, and, and let me say, I, you don't have to limit yourself just to the network side sure. of things. That you've done some cool things on the storage side yeah, too. Yeah. And, you know, please. Uh, and, and I think that's the interesting piece. What we've tried to build is just an absolute fabric, and I mean a storage fabric, a network fabric, and then a compute fabric. Yeah. And now what I'm really excited about is what fabrics are you going to build on top of the fabrics. Uh, VXLAN is just another fabric if built correctly on top of the fabric. Uh, the NetApp cluster mode, it's now a SAN, but now we can actually literally abstract that and map that across any of these fabrics. And now we can integrate it into the next level of fabric. If the SAN can now look at VXLANs, customers will literally be able to drag and drop in a virtual data center what connection from the host all the way to their virtual connection on the SAN. And that's a delineator from our standpoint and how we deliver our service so our providers and SaaS providers can roll out their applications faster to the market. Okay, and so how do you manage and orchestrate all of these you know, various technologies from the pieces of the stack that you discuss? Um, that is definitely a key piece <laughs> and uh, something that we're, we're thriving and, and trying to look for on top of it. Th there's still not sort of that wrapper that comes across any of them. Uh, and there's not some open API stack that comes together. And really what you end up doing is picking a best of breed, whether it's uh, Windows or it's Hyper-V or uh, um, VMware to manage up to a particular point, and then another provider sort of matching that. Uh, we are looking at some very new uh, monitoring level applications that can at least give us a homogeneous look from all the different sides so we can understand failures zones, hot pockets, that whole scenario. But from a pure orchestration layer, nobody's really mapped it end to end quite yet. Okay, and do, do you have some opinion on OpenStack? Uh, I definitely have a great opinion on OpenStack. I think the development on it is going great. Um, we're actually currently even looking at uh, ways to adopt it. Uh, our current customer base uh, has a particular level of shyness to it. Um, and definitely, I think uh, the leaders in the OpenStack community also might sort of be hindering it because um, they themselves are inhibiting other people from entering into it because they're seen as such a, a forerunner into it. So I think as that uh, community actually builds out a little bit more, um, some of the thought leaders sort of come to the head on that, I think it will allow a much rapid more adoption from the enterprise side into it. Okay, so uh, last question I have for you is the companies that are adopting uh, the, 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 s the solutions that the service providers that you work with um, are, are providing. You know, what's what's the profile of them? How are they? You know, is it is it a leap? Is it you know? Do they have to get you know the CEO buy-in? You know, what what's the profile of that uh, person? And you know, what, what, what's what's kind of some of their biggest challenges? Sure. That so uh, interesting enough, our end user adoption seems to be coming from the C levels. Okay. So it's a CTO or CIO understanding the transformation that's happening. And then just as important, it's the CFO yeah. that's understanding the transformation that's happening at his level. I mean, he can move those acquisition cycles, the operational cycles into that monolithic three or five year block, and now he can actually start as a CFO, work with a CIO, and derive value from an enterprise saying, this application is going to go through six month iteration cycles, so why doesn't our infrastructure, why doesn't our IT have that same level of agility? If that decision's made at that level, it's a rapid, rapid move to us. Um, from an IT level, it's usually a toe dip still. We get a DR, we get a development. And, and our favorite line is, your development is going to run better than your production probably in-house. So we'll take it, because six to eight months later, you'll start feeling much more comfortable migrating that in. Wow, is it like, rather than the consumerization of IT, it's like the dev op, <laughs> you know, taking over that Exactly, that, that, that and they dynamic. sort of drag everything with it. Okay. Um, <laughs> So you, you've been talking to a lot of companies. You know, step step outside of your current role. Sure. You know, wh what excites you about technology today? What have you seen that just kind of you know says wow to you? Um, y you know, what 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 I'm seeing actually is, and where I'm just saying wow, um, the the incubators, um, the startups are being able to bring uh, products to market faster because of cloud. But also what you're seeing happen uh, with this whole software defined methodology is a company like Brocade does an amazing job defining ASICs and hardware. And that is a life cycle. They actually have to develop it and print those and push those to markets. As you take solid foundations, but yet you move it up to software defined levels so that these rapid adopters, these uh, cloud companies, the startups, can now write code much, much more faster, you're going to be deriving much, much faster levels of uh, innovation all the way through the stack. Um, so I think in the next two to three years, once again, as that foundation gets more solid and the actual feature sets get pushed to the edge, the software levels, 
you're going to find a much rapid adoption, you're going to find new technologies people wouldn't have thought about, uh, you're going to find a much easier level uh, for end users of people to sort of manage their solutions, but there's still going to be that core that's just going to be incredibly, incredibly complex. Yeah. Uh, and I think we've heard that today. Well, it, 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 it's interesting. So, you know, my, my closing thought on it is, uh, you say, right, it's complicated. <laughs> and Brocade's trying to simplify things. Absolutely. I was actually talking to Lisa Kaywood here at Brocade and saying, you know, how do Ethernet fabrics and SDN, you know, how do we mesh those together? And Ethernet fabrics gives that simple, foundation. I've got solid hardware, it works. Uh, as you keep saying, you know, I grow, I add a switch, I add a new switch, I upgrade the software, and it, it, just, it just works. And upgrades so much simpler than what you were doing before, and SDN's going to allow me to control that. So, you know, simplicity in, you know, a solid foundation, and then I can really customize through, through the software feature. Um, so, uh, you know, Luke, Appreciate you coming on theCUBE. You are you. always welcome uh, <laughs> at, at our event. So we've done you know, calls with you, CUBE with you. And uh, you know, thank you for sharing with the community all that you're doing. Thank you for having me. All right, so this is Stu Miniman with wikibon.org. We'll be right back with our next guest after this quick break. <laughs>